words and papers, words and books, words on TV, words for crooks, words for comfort, words for peace, words to make the fighting cease, words to tell you. Welcome to the world of Wordaholics. And this is Wordaholics, the show all about language that knows a diphthong is two adjacent vowels in the same syllable, a monothong is a pure vowel sound, and a lacy thong is something else entirely. <laughs> Joining me are four fellow Wordaholics. They are Ed Byrne, Natalie Haynes, Hannah Gadsby, and Milton Jones. First things first, let's find out a little more about this group of wordaholics and their addictions to language. Let me introduce Ed Byrne, stand-up comedian par excellence and a native Dubliner. Ed, not that we doubt your ability to speak <laughs> English beautifully, nay hilariously, but do you have a particular favourite Irish word or phrase? Um, I, like, I like the Irish word for think, which is cap. I quite like that. I like that because it's cap, which sounds like cap. A thinking cap, so there's a certain symmetry to that. And the fact that the Irish word for sandwiches is capery, which always just made me feel like they were a very thoughtful food. <laughs> Next we turn to Natalie Haynes. Now, Natalie, you're a fan of everyone from Pliny the Elder to Buffy the Vampire Slayer. Uh, these days, fandom, I think, has a language all its own. Do you have any favourite words from fan culture? Yeah, I think I probably do. I think it's probably fan squee. Um, which I really like. Um, and fan, a, a fan squee, or two fan squee, is when you're so excited by something that has uh, relevance to your particular subject of enthusiasm that you can only make a kind of tiny, non-verbal squeak of joy. So, for example, I imagine there are people here tonight who, seeing you in real life, Giles, would have fan squeed. They would have gone... <laughs> like that. There's a little group of them sitting at That's the front. <laughs> looking like, where's, where's Wally lookalikes? There they are. Wonderful. <laughs> Thank you, Natalie. On my left is Hannah Gadsby, uh, Australian comic and qualified art historian. You presented, Hannah, a show, I think, about the nude in art. Do you have any favourite words to describe nudity? Um, well, generally it's just nude or nudity. They, but with art speak, what interests me uh, is not specific, curious words, but the power of the metaphor uh, when people talk about art, because they have to make the, the language very visual. Um, you can't just say black, right? Robert Hughes would say uh, hair like black ice cream, um, which there's no such thing, Robert. But um, <laughs> you can see it, can't you? You know, you know that kind of hair, um, but you don't know that kind of ice cream. So it kind of works, <laughs> but it doesn't. Don't think about it. Um, but my favourite is, of course, your Kenneth Clark. Uh, not the MP, uh, Mr. Civilizations. He, he once described the naked human form as a forked radish, um, <laughs> particularly, or, or a defenseless starfish, um, as opposed to those really, def you know, defensible starfish. You sound as if you've been a wonderful historian. You know they are going to remake the series Civilization. I know, how exciting. And you could be the presenter of it. Sure, I could. <laughs> and finally, we welcome back to Wordaholics the prince of puns, the wizard of wordplay, a man with a genius for jeu de mots. It's Milton Jones. Milton, your recent Radio 4 series, Thanks a Lot, Milton Jones, was all about solving other people's problems. Are there any words that people find particularly problematical? Uh, my own personal bugbear is a cross between an insect and a mammal. <laughs> but also, um, I'm fascinated too more by, um, you know, the way Americans call their hurricanes uh, Katrina, Amy or Winifred, but we just call ours Gail. <laughs> Okay, let's get down to business and let's kick things off with our letter of the week round. And in a real coup for the show, we've got a special treat for everyone. It's only the letter N. <laughs> Here she comes now, nudging her way nimbly down the Wordaholics catwalk, the letter N. What a natural beauty she is, a nicely nubile. There's nothing noxious about N. And may I say that dressed the naughty way she is today, it's hard not to stare at her delightful perky pair 
of knees. <laughs> she's nonchalant. She's nimble. She's going to nut me in the noggin. It's the letter M. <laughs> Now, Ed Byrne, I've got a newish N for you. What is the meaning of the phrase, to nuke the fridge? I know this. Oh. That's handy, isn't it? It is handy. Your score points, if you know it. Um, to nuke the fridge, it's another, it's another term for, to, it's similar to, to jump the shark. So I'll just leave that there. Um, <laughs> there you go. Points, please. <laughs> No, to nuke the fridge is it, it, it's to do something in a film where it's so stupid that the rest of the film you kind of just give up watching. And it comes from the, the last Indiana Jones film, and I hopefully the last Indiana Jones film. Because <laughs> the first three were great! But... You score all the points. That's a completely correct answer. Four points there to Ed Byrne. What a start. Well done. <laughs> this is, in fact, from the world of online film criticism. Nuking the fridge is the moment when a story loses all credibility. And it comes, as you said, from the fourth Indiana Jones film where the hero survived a nuclear explosion by hiding in a fridge. <laughs> as opposed to the gritty kitchen sink realism of the first three Indiana Jones films. <laughs> and of course, nuking the fridge is different from hiding in the fridge, um, because hiding in a fridge might not protect you from a nuclear holocaust. But if you're a lettuce, it will keep you wonderfully crisp. <laughs> there was uh, an American footballer called The Fridge, I think you'll find. Uh, probably because he was big and heavy. But I like to think it's because about once every 15 minutes he went... <laughs> <laughs> Anna, here is your N. Why might an Italian invite you to go to Naples? I'll give you a hint. People swear by it. N Naples. Go to Naples. Go to Naples. That's the expression. Um, go to hell? Is that a go to hell? Because I don't like Naples. Naples is kind of a horrible place. You get all four points. You've got it absolutely right. Absolutely. Yeah. That's what it means. I personally like Naples. Yeah, you're right to like Naples, but maybe Naples has changed. It is indeed a charming spin-off of the classic two-word Anglo-Saxon expression, the second word of which is off. Um, but this is a Sicilian expression, because for a Sicilian, going north to Naples is a fate worse than death. Yeah. The BBC equivalent, I suppose, is being relocated to Salford. <laughs> uh, finally, an N for Milton. Milton, why do we call a measure of drinks a nip? Uh, N-I-P. N-I-P. All I can think is ninjas in pyjamas. I'll give you a hint. It's not metric. I can imagine a Scottish person said, I give you a wee nip. Is it rhyme with sip, lip, dip? No, you're nowhere near. It doesn't sound like it, but in the 1700s, a nip was actually a real measurement. A nipperkin, around 280 millilitres or half a pint. Hence the famous 18th century joke, a pint... That's very nearly two nipperkins. That comes from the blood donor episode of Jonathan Swift's Half Hour. <laughs> okay, moving on. I'm always fascinated by abusive language. There's nothing I like better than getting home after a busy day, pulling out the dictionary, and looking up the meaning of what the cab driver's just been calling me. <laughs> Our next round is all about abusive language. I'm going to ask the panel to listen to some derogatory terms from the past and tell me to what kind of people these terms might refer. Natalie, let's start with you. In the late 19th century, who might have been described as a fish bagger? Is it someone who makes bags out of fish? <laughs> For fish. Is it someone who puts fish in a bag? Yeah, but what kind uh, of a bag are they putting it in? And what sort of person is it? Is it a nice bag? <laughs> is it not a nice bag? It's quite a nice bag. It's an average, it's a more than averagely nice bag. Well, it depends, I suppose, on how long you've had it. This is the worst clue anyone's ever had. <laughs> History of anything. It's almost the worst answer I've ever had. <laughs> I'll have to tell you. 
tell you what the answer but, but is. But so far we've got, who would you describe as a fish bagger? And we've got, it's someone who puts fish in bags. I mean, <laughs> that this is like possibly the, the easiest quiz ever. Yeah. <laughs> we, we need a little bit more than that, and I'll give you it, because you're not anywhere near it. It's right. somebody, and you, Ed, might be appreciating this, because you live just on the fringes of London in Essex. You could be said to be somebody from the suburbs, but you come into town to work. And a fish bagger was a suburbanite who worked in the city, so called because they would travel home with fish for the family evening meal packed into their briefcase. And it was coined by suburban tradesmen who resented people that lived in the suburbs but didn't, didn't do buy their shopping. The exactly. Ah. Ah. <laughs> Actually, these days, of course, suburbanites do still get their fish in bags because that's how it comes from Ocado. Um, <laughs> I have some abusive language for you, again from the late 19th century, who might have been described as a grout bag? Bonnie Tyler. <laughs> <laughs> Liv, Liv T Tyler. Um, Mary Tyler Moore. I can keep going. I can keep going. I won't. Oh, I'm um, getting it. Tyler and grout. Doing yeah. your grouting while you're doing your tiling. Yeah. I thought it was just gratuitous insults, but no. <laughs> It's sophisticated stuff from what Tasmania. What about uh, a builder's wife? Builders are part and parcel of the story, so I'm going to give you a point for that. But I'll tell you, I think I have to give you what the answer is. A grout bag is a hard worker, a, a foreman's pet. It's from the laborer's tool of the same name, which is only good for work and nothing else, a grout bag. Uh, an actual grout bag looks very much like a piping bag that you'd use for icing. Uh, you probably shouldn't confuse the two, of course, unless you're making rock cakes. Um, <laughs> but that's what a grout bag was. It was a bag in which grout was put and sort of squeezed out. Have you ever done any manual work? Uh, yeah, manual work, <laughs> but I've never made a cake. <laughs> <laughs> what about you, Milton? Are you a cake maker? Well, I had a thought to do some baking, but then it's gone. <laughs> Milton, some abuse for you. This from America of the 1960s, who might be described as a ball clanker. They say criminals always return to the scene of a crime, which is probably why we've got so many Australians over here. <laughs> I heard someone say once. Um, <laughs> So it's not a ball clanker, it's not as in Australia with a ball and chain no, sort of a thing. not at all. Uh, so ball, football, um, a bad footballer. Uh, no. Is it a ball breaker? Like no. Someone who's, you know, tough? You're nowhere near it. I'm going to tell you what it is. It's most unsavoury, really. A ball clanker is a gentleman who is known to boast about his sexual prowess, therefore by definition no gentleman. But I, in my view, why boast when you can rely on printed testimonials? <laughs> <laughs> Who might have been described in the 18th century as a dog buffer? A, a beautician? <laughs> <laughs> it sounds like somebody who would keep dogs apart when they were trying to fight, maybe. Well, they Jog. do keep... I'm going to give you a point, because they do keep dogs apart, but from their owners. A dog buffer is someone who steals dogs. Although, personally, I prefer the term a Jack Rustler. <laughs> Now, I'm going to encourage the panel to vent their own prejudices. Can you invent some new terms of abuse for people that particularly annoy you? Natalie, would you like to go first? Um, as a keen user of Regent's Park, as you know me to be, uh, I have turned against people who I consider to be uh, park inappropriate. And my current bet noir is people who like to play the guitar in the park, as though we might discover some kind of musical genius there. And I would like to coin the word pluckwit. <laughs> Milton, who have you got it in for? People who write on your tablecloth are cheeky scalawagamamas. <laughs> <laughs> and anything else? Uh, well, I was thinking uh, people who don't uh, indicate when they're driving are called taxi drivers. <laughs> Ed, I'm sure you've got something to offer us. Um, I hate people who wear T-shirts with band names written on them without owning a single record by those bands. <laughs> <laughs> those people 
people who wouldn't listen to heavy metal in a blue fit wearing Iron Maiden t-shirts. Actually, you should be able to say, if someone's wearing a Judas Priest t-shirt, you should be able to say to them, what's your favourite album? And if they even just hesitate for a moment, rip it off them. <laughs> Walk around naked. Mm. People, people like that, people who just wear band names uh, without even liking the band, and I would call them Dyson Airblades. <laughs> <laughs> because they're not really fans. Mm. <laughs> it is a positive pleasure to be among such an impressive group of bigots. <laughs> it is the end of the round and time to look at the scores. Hannah and Milton are in second place, thanks to that wonderful final rally there from Ed and the Pluckwit bonus. Natalie and Ed are just ahead. Well done then. <laughs> Some words exist in one language and don't in others. For example, someone told me the other day that the English language has no word for gullible. Amazing. <laughs> uh, this next round is called You Can't Say That, and it's all about situations we don't have a word for, but other countries do. Hannah, a Tamil word for you. What does Sindhu Geratu mean? Sindhu Geratu. I can give you some options. Yes, please. Is it A, to give a secret signal with your finger? B, to hold forth confidently on a subject you know nothing about? Or C, to continually overestimate the value of your house in conversation? I am definitely doing B at the moment. You think it's... I the... can't even pronounce the word. Sindhu Giratu? It's a yep. Tamil word. Tamil, great. Yeah. And you think it's B, you're wrong. It's A, oh. to give someone a sign by poking them with your finger, unobserved by anyone else. Uh, my wife and I have a secret sign of our own. If she wants me to regale her with anecdotes of my glorious past, she says code words to me. Code words being, oh, do be quiet, child. <laughs> <laughs> and lastly, Natalie, the Indonesian word, lata. Uh, I think it's the Indonesian program that's on, on a Friday night presented by Jules Holland. <laughs> I'll give you three alternatives. Is it A, the last sliver of soap in a soap dish? B, persistently being late to meetings you've set up? Or C, uncontrollably saying embarrassing things? Lata. I'd like it to be that uncontrollable lateness one, but I think it probably isn't. So I'm going to go with the Soap. But You're I'm wrong. Do it with no conviction at all. You've done it with no conviction. You score no points. It's C. A latter is the uncontrollable habit of saying embarrassing things. Wait a second, but we have a word for that. It's called you kipper. <laughs> Now, on this show, we love words with a passion that's almost indecent. Although even we, wordholics, have certain words that we loathe and never wish to see or hear again. This round is called Words Fail Us, and it's where our panel get to identify the words they dislike the most. Hannah, you get to go first. What word or words would you happily never hear again? I'd, I'd like to ban the word blog. Oh. Which sort of makes it sound like freedom of speech has gone down the toilet, you know. It's just... <laughs> Blog. <laughs> Milton, what word would you send to Naples? Uh, <laughs> Christmas. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and the way Christians cynically jump on the bandwagon to get their message across. <laughs> Ed, uh, give me a word you simply can't tolerate. I don't like... Uh portmanteaus. I don't like words like glamping, for instance, which is, you know, a derivation of the words glamorous and camping. We stay in a yurt, which is more expensive than a hotel. <laughs> but don't realize yurt is a derivation of the words yura and twit. <laughs> but, uh, the one, the one that, that particularly annoys me is fablet. Fablet is a portmanteau that particularly annoys what me. What is a fablet? Fablet, fablet is, a, is an electronic device that's too big to be a phone and too small to be considered a tablet. So it's called... A, yes, exactly. See, some people hadn't even heard that word, and now that you know its existence, you won't even sleep tonight with the rage. <laughs> if you've invented something that's too big to be called a phone and too small to be called a tablet, your question should not be, what do we call it? Your question should be, what am I doing with my life? <laughs> Finally, Natalie, what word would you cast into Out of Darkness? 
Uh, I would like to get rid of unnecessary plurals used for sort of faux jocularity. I don't like any ways when somebody means any way. Um, <laughs> and also, and I can barely say it, I hate it so much, although I don't think it's technically a plural, I think it's a contraction, but simples. <laughs> Which I think is a contraction for as simple as, but I hate it so much that even uh, my teeth are now hurting. I'm with you about these plurals, because meals... I won't have it. I think meals is so annoying now, because people... I was in Nando's last night, and... Nando. Uh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> nice waitress came up and said, uh, are you enjoying your meals? How are your meals? You know, it's yes, not so meals. So I mean, I mean I, it's just me yes. and a little portion of whatever they give you at Nando. Um, <laughs> how are you enjoying your meals? But even if there were two of you, you would be communally sharing a meal. Yes. It's one communal event, a meal. Stop atomizing my life, people of Nando. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Well, all those words have been sent to a place where they'll never be heard of again. Radio 3. <laughs> oh, oh, gosh, we've reached the final round. Language never stays the same as new words enter the lexicon, so old words slip into the background, never to be heard of again. Who now remembers such long-forgotten terms as kerglaf, taromancy, state pension? <laughs> This round is called New Words for Old, and it's where I ask the panel to listen to some words from the past and tell us what they mean in the language of today. This week's words come from the Canting Academy, a dictionary of thieves' slang published in 1673 by the, to some extent, unfortunately named Richard Head. Uh, Milton Jones, who or what was old Mr. Gorey? Mr. Gore is nothing to do with Al Gore, is it? And his nope. band, the Al Gore Rhythms. <laughs> <laughs> this comes from a dictionary published in 1673. I'll give you a multiple choice. Was old Mr. Gore A, a hangman, B, a knife, or C, a coin? Old Mr. Gore. A uh, coin, I think. It feels treasury. It feels piratey. Old Mr. Gore. <laughs> It is a coin. It's a gold coin. It's thought it might come from Gore, uh, which was a trading outpost on the Gold Coast. Mm -hmm. So I think you get that. Uh, next time you go to the news agents, ask them if you can pay with old Mr. Gore. <laughs> It'll be easier than getting him to accept a Scottish £20 note. <laughs> Edburn, what did yes. it mean to frummage him? A, to choke someone. B, to cosh someone. C, to steal apples. To frummage him. But it's, is it a compound word? Is it like, what did you do to him? I frummaged him. Um, I'll say it's to choke somebody. And you get the points for that. It is to choke someone. Uh, as a teenager, I remember at school playing rugby. I was in the middle of the scrum, couldn't see anything, reached out, grabbed onto someone, found my hand tight around the neck of my best friend, choking him. Essentially, I had a rummage and a frummage in the middle of the scrummage. <laughs> Hannah Gadsby, what does it mean to bite the Roger? Ooh. <laughs> Do you suppose it's A, to die, B, to become a pirate, or C, to steal an overcoat, to bite the roger? I reckon it's going to, this, uh, you steal an overcoat? It is to steal an overcoat. I have no idea how you got it No, right, I didn't. I just, this is the only one I remembered. Uh, uh, <laughs> but you're, I'm going to have to give you the points because you, you get the correct you answer. However you got there, you, you score the points. Uh, it is C, biting the roger is to steal an overcoat. How, Similarly... Mm -hmm. how do, do you know how... I would have got there if I'd have known? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> if you'd known the answer, you would have got there. Yeah. Uh, cool. Um, similarly, it's, it's slang of the period. To, to bite the wiper was to steal a handkerchief, and to roger the wiper, obviously something quite different. <laughs> but to, to bite the roger, roger was a, a nickname for an overcoat. Uh, and finally, Natalie, what is a cropping ken? Is it the act of cropping someone called Ken out of a picture. <laughs> For example, now you'd probably do it with Photoshop, but in 16 Wahooda, um, you'd have probably got some scissors and a portrait and then just chopped them off the side. It's not that kind That's of That's why mechanism. people called Ken are always made to stand on the side of wedding photographs. <laughs> <laughs> That's objectively true. I'm going to give you some alternatives. A cropping Ken. Is it A, a toilet, B, a crowbar, or C, the driver of a getaway horse and cart? <laughs> 
generally on this programme it's syphilis, and if it can't be syphilis, it's sewers. So I'm going to go with the toilet, <laughs> working on the premise of the wordaholic's rule of thumb. <laughs> You're right. <laughs> It is. A crop in Ken is a toilet or a privy. Ken meaning house and crop in meaning, well, well, you can imagine. <laughs> anyway. Okay, we've come to the end of another massacre of the mother tongue. And as I look at the scores, I can see that in second place we have, oh, Hannah and Milton, meaning that this week's winners are Natalie and Ed. Well done, then. <laughs> Celebratory nippigins all round for our winners, while our losers can go to Naples. <laughs> winners, before you go, could you describe your wordaholics experience in one word, Natalie? Um, I'm going with Ed's word for um, his Irish word from the beginning, which was kiap. Was that right? Kiap. Kiap. I've never heard that word before, and now I intend to take it and use it. Good. What about you, Ed? What have you learned? What's the one word you've got to take away from today? I have a word for how I'm feeling, which is transeditorial which is, I, I don't know how I feel about the show until I hear what it sounds like when it's been cut down to half an hour. <laughs> Rest assured, you'll still be in it, which is the good news. Uh, Hannah, well done. Uh, coming second. Thanks. Uh, <laughs> only two teams, but you are a loser. What's, what's the word you take away from today? Now you call me a loser, I won't... Well, I'm only calling you a loser because you, you lost. <laughs> Coming clear. It's becoming clear. And the essence of the game is a competition between two sides. The winners win, the losers, they lose. They fail, they disappoint, they let themselves and their families down. <laughs> but the programme isn't necessarily heard in Australia or Tasmania, so possibly I'm your loved ones will not hear this. Oh, but it is. Apparently it is being broadcast yeah. uh, to the former colonists, so maybe... Uh, <laughs> The embarrassment will go global. In yeah. fact, your failure is trending now, Hannah. Your... <laughs> Milton, what's the word that for you sums up today's wordaholics experience? Win. <laughs> That's all from this week's Wordaholics. Will you please thank one more time our wonderful guests, Ed Byrne, Natalie Haynes, Helen Gadsby, and Milton Jones. Until next time, goodbye. <laughs> You've been listening to Wordaholics, chaired by me, 